All right, well, good morning, everyone. Looks like our numbers are a little down today, but I don't know what's going on. The same thing was true for me in school this week. All three of my, all three of my courses were, were down, yeah, fall break. But we had parent day on campus, and so I think kids took off from school to go to... Remember some of the That's true as well. But I'm missing a number of ladies that are usually up front here, so. I think Bonita's with her sister. Ah. Good morning. Here, before you guys get too far. Why? <laughs> yeah, if they don't rhyme, she can't read it. The clock is moving ahead without me, so we're, we're going to get started and continue on in God's promises. Would you open us this morning? Continued on in the promises um, for the Christian world, because I said we're going to be pretty much in that throughout the rest of this month, because there's just so many, because that's who God is really talking to, and, and a great deal is His people. And today is going to be focused on the church, but before I get to that, of course, I always like to review where we were last week, make sure we're kind of still all on the same page. So we talked about God's Word last week, uh, the Bible, and there were some word illustrations in there that if you've been in church very long, you're used to seeing, particularly where the Word is compared to various food sources like meat. This level of biblical understanding comes to those who blank to know God in a more complete manner. Who want to. It's a want to. You have to want to to get there. It doesn't just happen. But I, my personal opinion, there's also some cards coming around for um, Paul and Sharon and for Ron um, Woodard. Woodard. So if you would please sign those, those both of course, former attenders of, of this class who are dealing with big time medical issues. Um, you have to want to, but I think that's really kind of a sign and symptom of a true believer. A true believer is going to want to. Now, there will be seasons in your life where you're focused the wrong direction, I get that. Um, we've all been there. But over the course of your life, if you are a believer, you're going to want to see, get into God's Word. It's just going to be a thing. The Holy Spirit's going to want you to get there. Another one of the word pictures was honey. This aspect suggests the promise of both what and delight coming from God's word. Pleasure. 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 That there's pleasure in getting into God's word. That you get in there and go, 
this is great. I love this stuff. Um, Cindy's here. She wasn't here last week, but I think I kind of mentioned that last week that I'm forever yelling at her if she's upstairs in the room where I'm going through God's word and all of a sudden something new comes out, which happens to me all the time, even on a passage that I've studied, you know, 82 times. And I go, hey, sin, look at this. Da, 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 da. <laughs> she's always very gracious to go, okay, tell me what you learned this time. <laughs> but that we get real pleasure out of it. That it's like honey. It tastes good. The promise of blessing comes out of what two sources that we pulled out last week? What are the two sources for blessing? Obedience and Bible reading. Yeah, obedience and Bible reading. One should lead to the other. They work hand in hand. Obedience takes you into Bible reading. Bible reading takes you back into obedience. And it goes back and forth between the two. And then out of that comes blessing. That true sense of, of happiness. And then finally, the promise of joy, because that's always a big thing in here. The promise of joy comes from what? A right relationship with God. Absolutely. That right relationship with God. Now I get joy. Joy has something far greater than happiness. Happiness comes and goes. If you've ever said hello to me in the morning and how's it going, my standard response is another happy day. And then generally when I'm talking to somebody that doesn't know me, I'll, I'll finish off that by saying because happiness has nothing to do with circumstances. It's a choice. And I always watch that person go, kind of go, oh, well, yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So it's not based on, but joy is that underlying, even when things aren't happy, that you still have. And that comes out of that right relationship with God. Okay. Here's something we're going to do, fun and different. This is something that my students really, really enjoy. <laughs> so make sure you have a writing implement. Yeah, like my students. My students have a test every other Friday, and I'm always amazed that every other Friday somebody comes up to me and says, We're going to the second, you have a pen. Really? You didn't know it was test day? Like when I handed out the study guide two days before, and I told you each and every week, each and every time that every other Friday would be a quiz.
You don't have to put your name on it. This is not going in your official Sunday school attendance record. You don't lose church membership if you don't pass. It's just something new and different I thought I would do. <laughs> from Romania and he was on some trivia thing and he had a call of a person so he calls me because it was a Bible question and it was a very obscure question he said dad I, I'm I got like three minutes I can call for it so I'm calling you and, and what is the only prophet that was called to be a prophet from his mother's womb I'm not sure. I said, the first one that prop, I think is Jeremiah. He said, that's one of the four answers. Okay, I'm going with that. I said, go with it. So then he texted me a couple minutes later. It was right. I said, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here we go. You can self-grade your answers. I'm not going to make you switch papers and all those other fun things. So you can grade your own. Question one, worshiping God in nature is a good, is a good substitute for going to church. False. False. Hebrews 10.25 will give you the answer on that one. In the first century, believers met on Sunday. False. True. <laughs> Acts 20, verse 7. They begin to meet on Sunday, on the the day of, of resurrection. Although the Bible teaches giving, question three, it does not specifically refer to the taking of a collection. False. False. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. It does not specifically refer to the taking of a collection. Question four, loving discipline of its members is the responsibility of every local church. True. Absolutely true. First Corinthians chapter five, pretty much that entire chapter. And the key word there, of course, of course is loving discipline. Because what is the purpose of church discipline? Education. Nope. Oh, restoration. Bring them back. Restore them into a good relationship. Question five. Pentecost marks the birthday of the church. Absolutely true. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 and 4. We're going to discuss that later in, in class. But that marks the beginning of the church, and I'll explain why. Question six. Oops, there's the answer. Um, the only reason for going to church is to hear the preaching of the word. Well, most preachers would like to think that's the only reason you come, but no. Fact is, that's way that should be like kind of way down on the list. Number seven: problems arose in the Corinthian church because of too much emphasis on the personality of its leaders. How many say true? How many say false? I would say the only. Yeah. It is true. How many answer it? They are. Yeah, how many said I ain't answering that? First Corinthians chapter three, and they're busy talking about you know who they fault, you know all that stuff, personalities. Question eight: Elder and deacon were offices in the New Testament churches. Absolutely true, and we're going through that right now here. Pastor is not, but it is lumped in with that idea of elder. Yeah. It's, yeah. Question nine. The chief cornerstone of the church is Christ. Yes. I hope that's 100%. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. And finally, number 10. 
The first century church had a commissioning service for missionaries. Absolutely true. Acts chapter 13. So how'd you do? <laughs> Acts 13, verses 1 through 3. So I thought this would be a little fun, a little different, but this is all in aspect and questions about the church, something that you guys go to every week, something that you are a member of globally and then individually of Levine Baptist Church, and we need to know what is true about the church, what isn't true about the church. So like I said, I thought this was just kind of some a fun way to introduce this thing than my common illustration stuff. So let's get in and begin to look at the church and promises for the church right from the very beginning. While we need to be careful to distinguish the church from Israel, I mentioned that when we had promises for Israel, for the Jewish people, we can still enjoy many of the same things. For instance, Psalm verse 84, verses 1 and 2. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord of hosts. I long and yearn for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. So here was a here is a comment for the Jewish people, a song that they would sing about how they love to come into the dwelling place of the Lord. For them, that would have been the temple. And he, we as Christians can long for being able to come to church, to get together with other believers, to have that fellowship, all of that sort of thing. To hear the word of the Lord, to sing and worship corporately, to do all that stuff. So we can enjoy many of the same things. Let's look at a Greek term that's used for both the, the people of God in the Old Testament, the Israelites, and for the church. That word being ecclesia. The word means a calling out from. And in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the, the first time that the Old Testament is really completely translated out of Hebrew, you'll see the word ecclesia for the gathering of, of Israel. The same word was used commonly for a body of citizens to discuss the affairs of state. So our House of Representatives, our Senate, would have been referred to in Greek as an ecclesia, a gathering of citizens to discuss the state. You'll find the word translated as assembly and used in that regular way in Acts 19, verse 39, where it's just kind of talks about a gathering of people together. In the Septuagint that I mentioned, the word is used for the gathering of Israel for any number of purposes. And the same word is translated as congregation in our English Bibles in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 12. In the New Testament, though, the word has really a double application when applied to Christians, this word ecclesia, to the whole of the redeemed people. Matthew 16, 18. And Ephesians 1.22. Oh, excuse me. That's one of the ones that didn't get a hand out. I have it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hold on. I have it. Okay, um, you got it? Go ahead. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. For the church. So in both of those passages, we see the church, that's the word ecclesia, but it's talking about the whole of redeemed people, all of the church being every believer everywhere. 
but it's also in the singular. The group consisting just of individual professed believers. Matthew 18, 17. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So this is individual believers that are making up a particular body, much like Levine Baptist Church. 1 Corinthians 1, 2. So there's an individual church, again, individual believers making up a particular church. This happens to be the church in Corinth. So it, that word ecclesia applies both globally, just kind of Christian, all Christians, all believers everywhere, and then to individual believers making up a particular body. This then really is a great word to describe the Lord's body made up of both Jews and Gentiles because the individuals making up an individual church or for all believers everywhere. The promise though really is to build the church. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. There's that same verse, we just read, we read it twice now where he's going to build the church. There's the promise. Now, while some want to make Peter the focus here and call him the first pope, particularly our, our Catholic friends, the term rock and Peter here is more of a play on words because in the Old Testament, the term rock is always indicative when it's used in a metaphoric method of God himself upon this rock. Paul has no problem in identifying Jesus as the rock. 1 Corinthians 10.4 Somebody's got it. So there he identifies Jesus as the rock. God in the Old Testament, God the Father is identified as the rock. Here in the New Testament, Jesus is identified as the rock. So what we have kind of is a play on words of Peter, but where does that come from then? So what Jesus meant when he calls Peter the rock, because we have the writer saying Jesus is the rock, Old Testament, God is the rock. Jesus would build his church not on Peter particularly, but on Peter's heaven-given revelation of Jesus' deity as the Son of the living God in Matthew 16, 16. But who do you say that I am? And Peter makes that great confession. And of course, Jesus says, hey, you didn't get this other than my Father, the Holy Spirit, telling you this. And then later, Jesus identified as that same rock. So... Jesus is saying, upon this rock that you've identified, which is me, that's what's going to go. But I'm naming you, Peter, now, the rock. So I, we have this play on words here that, that works both. But now Peter has identified him. And Jesus said, you're absolutely spot on. The church is built on Jesus because he bought her with his own blood. And then after his ascension, he started building it. Dr. Campbell Morgan, so this is again why, why I say the Pentecost is, is going to be the beginning of the church, is the birthday of the church. Dr. Campbell Morgan reminds us that the word the Lord employed, this ecclesia was one that signified more than the mere act of building, or when he talked about, I'm going to build this church. It has within itself the suggestiveness of the formation of a dynasty or an, an entire economy, which is interpreted by the words then, my ecclesia, my church. I'm going to build, I'm going to build this entire dynasty, I'm going to build this entire economy that is built upon 
my ecclesia, my church. I'm going to be the one who builds it. But it's going to be far something far greater than a, a addition if you added up the individual component parts. The sum total is going to be far greater than that. Something to keep in mind though is the word church is never ever used of a building in either the Old Testament or the New Testament. It never refers to building B or the sanctuary. That's not the church. That is a building where the church gathers. Now we refer to it as a church in our common language, but biblically speaking, that is, we could sell this property, move to our, build a new facility over at our 15 acre lot, which I hope we will do at some point in the future. And this could end up turning out to be who knows what. Yeah. Somebody could buy it. I know at one point the school district came over and was seriously considering looking when they heard we might be selling it because their office is right across the street. Hey, we could buy this property, go in here. But so this could become a, a school district office. Who knows? This is not the church. It's never used of a building. It's not bricks and mortar, but an assembly of living stones that has intentionally gathered together. So all of the promises are never to a building, they are to people. Listen to just a few ways that the church is described. The body, bride, or house of Christ. And I've, I'll give you all of those, and they're all written for you at the bottom of your handout. The house, habitation, temple of God. God's building, his husbandry, his heritage. The church of God. The church of the living God. The church of the firstborn. This is all the ways that the church is described in the New Testament. None of that has to do with a building. It all has to do with people. With you. And then finally this one. The family in heaven and earth. This is why I so often in my welcome on Sunday mornings, I, and particularly to the, those watching online, I say welcome to the family. Because that's what this is. That's what the church is. And we can be as dysfunctional as any family on the planet. <laughs> but at the end of the day, we are still family. The church began with Jesus, who is the foundation. A church before his death would have been an unredeemed church. So the church did not start before Jesus died. It would have been an unredeemed church. A church before his resurrection. This is why the church did not start during those three days would have been a church without the indwelling spirit which means we would not be all together a church before his ascension would have been a headless body we would have been a body but who's who's in charge Jesus. not till his ascension not till he's risen because of this final one. So the church's birthday is Pentecost through the coming of the Holy Spirit that makes us all one. That's why I had on that true false, what is the birthday of the church? That's, it can't be, yes? That's where after they, they spoke to the crowd and it said then they joined us. Yes. They joined the church. Exactly. So the church still looks to Pentecost as being kind of its birthday. The day that the church came in to really existence. As we know and understand the church. So let me give you some, because this whole series is about promises, right? <laughs> That's what we've been focused on. Let me give you some promises. And if you have a, uh, a 
Bible verse, chances are here's where you're going to be coming out now because this is where the vast majority of them are. One of the reasons that the church exists is to display the wisdom of God. Ephesians 3.10 To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. There's one of the great promises for the church. You are here to display God's wisdom. Which is amazing that he uses this dysfunctional group to show how wise he is. But that's exactly how it shows how wise he is. Because he can grab a dysfunctional group of people and do amazing things. and shows his wisdom. Another reason is to clearly display the glory of God. Ephesians 3.21 To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Again, we're here to display God's glory because that will draw people. His wisdom, His glory. Of course, the glue that is to hold this all together is love. John 15, 12. This is my command, love one another as I have loved you. That's what holds the church together. That's the glue. Because love is a feeling that comes and goes, right? What is love, biblically speaking? It's an action, it's some, which means it is a choice. Because you don't just... Actions don't just happen until you decide to do them. Which parents, you all remember when your kid did something and you caught them at it? What was the first thing they said? I didn't mean to. Um, yeah, you did. <laughs> your hand didn't accidentally leave your pocket and smack your brother. <laughs> it was not an accident. It's a choice. Love is a choice. You ran into it on Yes. I was just holding my hand out. Yeah. So love is that glue that does this. The church is promised Jesus as its head. Ephesians 1.22 and 4.15. Start with Ephesians 1.22. And 415. Instead, speaking in truth, in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ. So there's that promise that Jesus will be the head of the church. The church needs to remember that. Because people like to become what? The head. They like to be in charge. They like to be have the power, but the power and the headship all belongs to Jesus. This is his church. See, Jesus is never called the king of the church. You notice? All, if you read all through the New Testament, he's never called the king of the church. Even though spiritually, of course, he is sovereign. King is one of those divine titles, and the church in worship joins Israel in exalting the king, eternal, immortal, invisible. 1 Timothy 1.17. But Jesus' kingship is coming. And when that happens, according to the book of Revelation, by the way, the only book that has a promise of blessing, if you read it, so I would be reading Revelation, <laughs> because God said, I will bless you if you read this. The church will reign with him when he gets into his physical kingship which is going to be an amazing time. The church can make use of promised gifts. Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So all of those things are gifts, and the church can use them. 
and should be using them, all of them, which is why the church needs to come together, because the gifts that Pam has been given and the gifts that Bill has been given and the gifts that I have been given are all different, but they all then come and work together that builds up the entire body. And I need the gifts that everybody else has, desperately, because I don't have them. <laughs> so I need them to come and minister their use of their gifts. And Jesus, the church can make use of all of those promised gifts. The church has been promised completeness in Jesus. In the New Living Translation, it says it like this in Colossians 2.10. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. You have been promised completeness. Colossians 2.10. You're not, you don't have to worry about, can I, how do I finally figure out who I am and make myself everything that I need to be? You're not, but God will. He will make you, you will be complete in everything that he wants you to be. You have a promise of that. Isn't that great news? Yes. People are always trying to find themselves. <laughs> Which is, in, yeah, which is exactly who they find, and sometimes it's not who they were looking for. The church has the Lord's promised love, Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's an amazing amount of love. Those of you that have been married, have you ever really experienced that kind of love of your husband literally dying for you? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Hang in there, baby. Yeah. But being willing to completely, that's how we're to love. And you have that promised love as Christ loved the church. His undying love for the church is seen in his death for her and his desire to sanctify her in making her the object of his grace, his unearned favor, and in his request for her subjection to himself. That's where his love shows up. The church has the promise of being cared for. Ephesians 5, 29. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. So, much like you take care of yourself, when you're hungry, you get something to eat, when you're thirsty, you get something to drink. Christ says, I'm going to care for the church like you intentionally tend to take care of yourself and even more so we have the promise of protection and preservation Matthew 16 18 there's where I'll get that one out um, Psalm 89 17 And Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon forged against you will prevail. That's pretty strong protection. Most of this class is old enough to remember the old Superman TV show. Uh, what's his name? Not Christopher Reeve, but George Reeves. And the bad guy would come out, of course, with his revolver, because it's the only kind of gun that was around at the time. And he would stand there and puff his chest out. Bing, 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 you know. <laughs> Shoot me, go right ahead. That kind of confidence in that kind of protection, that there's not a weapon forged against you that can prevail. None. 
including the weapons of mean words mm -hmm. and backdoor sniping. Those weapons that have been forged against you cannot prevail if you are dependent upon the love of Christ. Sir? That, when you just take that right there, that should give us, the church body, an amazing amount of confidence each and every day. That this world has no power over us. And our protection comes from the very person that created us, mm -hmm. loves us. I mean, it, it's, it's a wow moment. It's a, it's a major wow moment. Yeah. And the church needs to understand that it is invincible because of who it belongs to. You are invincible. You cannot be stopped. Amen. Cannot. Which is why Satan always wants to get you in you and get you to stop yourself. Mm -hmm. Because that's the only way that you can be stopped is if you stop. You cannot be stopped. You can stop yourself. Men and the forces of Satan have consistently tried to destroy the church from the outside and now really from the inside. But, but God, my, my favorite phrase on the planet, but God. That cannot and will not ever be successful because the church, like its head to which it is attached, is eternal. The church is eternal. You cannot be stopped. You cannot be defeated. We also have the, the church has the promised presence of Jesus. Matthew 18 20. For where two or three gather together because they are mine, I am there among them. One of probably the most quoted verses in a church. And Hebrews 13, 5. Your life should be free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And where two or three are gathered, I am there with you. We have the promise of the presence of Jesus, which goes right back to that prior promise of protection and preservation. All these promises are interlinked. I've broken them out one by one, but this is a big giant ball that's all together. They are not separate individual promises. They're all part of the same thing. Then we also have this promise, which you're thinking, really? We have the promise of unity. Galatians 3.28 There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither born nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You are all one. All of those things that we do. Mankind is great at dividing ourselves. We divide ourselves by skin tone. We, dis, we divide ourselves by geographical living reasons, areas. We divide ourselves by religion. We divide our, If we can figure out a way to divide ourselves, we will divide ourselves. And God says, knock it off. You are all one. Particularly in the church. That's a promise of unity. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Always keep yourselves united in the Holy Spirit and bind yourselves together with peace. We are all one body. We have the same spirit, and we have all been called to the same glorious future. That little thing is written in command language. Now, unfortunately, <laughs> I've been involved in churches for a long time. This will not be fully realized until Jesus comes. Because even in the church, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, bond nor free, male or female, we divide ourselves here. And generally over stupid stuff. Generally. But we are commanded to be working towards unity all the time. 
because that's a promise that God says, I'm going to do that. We have a promise of a glorious, completed relationship. John 14, 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Ephesians 5, 27. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot, unwrinkle, or any such stuff, that she might be holy and without flesh. Listen to those promises. This is what the church longs for. This is what we're looking for. This is what we're going for. This is going to happen at some point in the future, and this is what our longing is. We want to have that completed relationship with Jesus Christ, which also goes to all these other promises that we've seen. When you read the Song of Solomon, the Song of Solomon, by the way, when you read it, but it can be used as and I've seen Bible scholars use it as a metaphor for the relationship between Jesus and the church. How he longs for, and how the church, the bride of Christ, longs for the husband. How they view each other. We have a, that promise of a glorious, completed relationship. And then finally, we have the promise of revival. Uh, don't think necessarily old time church revivals bringing in a special guy meeting every night getting your emotions all worked up in the, in the, which can be a part of it but in the church's confused divided and currently impoverished condition you see impoverished absolutely remember on the promises for God's word, what is one of the starvation things that the world is starving? It's a proper teaching and exposition of God's word. And the church itself is starving because there just isn't enough of that. In the church's current confused, divided, and impoverished condition, it's in need, it is in need of a mighty revival from God. Here's just a couple of promises that the church can appropriate from the Old Testament. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2. Uh, did I give that one out? Or did I just think about it? I think I just thought about it. I've got it here. Okay. Lord, I have heard the report about you, and I hear. O Lord, provide the work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Here's the prophet Habakkuk, who also looks at evil. He asks that old question of why does bad stuff happen to good people? Hey, God, why are, why are you allowing evil to go on? But here he's, here's the prophet now saying, God, give us revival. Bring us back to all those other promises that you've talked about. Let us remember that. Let us become that invincible force that cannot be stopped. The only hope that the world has for God's people to be energized to take the gospel message to every set of ears is the hope and sure knowledge that some will be saved and that others will begin to fully live the life that is within them. We need to remember that that is God's promise. That's going to happen. That some will be saved and others will finally wake up and live the life that is in them. Church history shows us that in the midst of the darkest times that the church has faced, that God breaks out in blessing to his people and causes his light to shine in ways that has never happened before. Which again goes to show God's wisdom and glory, some of those promises that we saw early on. And in the darkest days of the church, we see God do that again and again and again. Hosea chapter 6 verses 1 through 3. Did I give that one out? See, I was I was overly confident this week. I had it all done way ahead of time. And then I got here this morning and went. What's that? Okay. Hosea Hosea six verses one through three. 
Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, that he will heal us. He has wounded us, that he will bandage us. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day, that we may live before him. So let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going forth is as certain as the dawn, and he will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain water in the earth. Which is very refreshing. Don't you love it when Cindy and I all go out, oh, I can smell rain. You know that smell, right? It's, it's, a, it's a thing. But you, yes. Yeah, yeah, it only happens four days a year, but you get that very refreshing. But it says, here, let's go, because the writer there, the prophet Hosea says, God will do that. He understands this is God, how God acts, that he will revive us, that he will... He has broken us, but why has he broken us? To get us to focus back in, and then when we do that, he says, I'm going to bind you back up and send you back out again because you are invincible. And there are times I have to remind you that you're invincible because the enemy wants to think that you're broken, that you're inconsequential, that you're old, that you're... You didn't go to seminary. That you know, Fill your heads with all kinds of lies and nonsense. Whereas God says you're an invincible, unstoppable force. Hey, Eric, quick yes. question on, on that passage. Hosea was one of the Old Testament prophets, right? He was. So he will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day. Yeah. <laughs> go figure. <laughs> sounds, sounds like what? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's that word picture of, of what gets to coming, and, and Hosea is warning the kingdom. He's warning Israel, the northern kingdom, of what, what is coming. But all of those prophets, those what we call the minor prophets, are all busy warning Judah and Israel that if you don't do it exactly like Moses said, you're going to go back into bondage. And of course we see Israel go into bondage, Judah go back into bondage, go back in, and be taken out of the land, which is what Moses had said would happen. Amazing. The great prophet Moses tells him, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And sure enough, God honors his word. But all of those prophets, when they pronounced that gloom and doom, always had a promise of eventual hope. Which is, takes us back to that great promise of hope. Back, Remember I gave you that big fancy word, the Proto-Evangelion? Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and I will send another, the serpent will bruise his heel, but he will crush its head. There's that great promise, the first gospel, the first good news, and all the minor prophets come in with promises like that one that we just read in Hosea that says, even though you're going to be beat up because y'all were a little disobedient, God is going to bind you back up. He's going to revive you and make you a people again. What we have to remember, though, is that the collective revival begins as an individual revival. You can't ask for the revival of the church if you're not asking for revival. We have to be willing to remove or at least let go of the stumbling blocks that would prevent that. Let go of those stumbling blocks that keep you from getting personal revival. Because I'll tell you what, you get personally revived, you're going to be like a COVID virus. You're going to spread. And far faster than a COVID virus does. Because then others are going to say, hey, I want that revival. I want what she's got. I want what he's got. And then that individual revival becomes a corporate revival, which becomes a city revival, which becomes a state revival, which becomes a national revival. And we've seen it before. So if God's done it before, he can do it again. The last thing I want to hit in our final few minutes is ministers in the church. Because all of you are promises about the church. As we read in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, the pastors and teachers have the role of preparing the work preparing the church for the work of ministry. Which means, folks, you all are ministers. 
It's not the guy who stands up here at Sunday school or the guy that stands up there in, in building A. They're referred to as a minister. You are ministers because it's my job, it's Jim's job to prepare you, the church, for works of ministry. Well, only ministers can do works of ministry. You all are ministers. So every member of the church can claim passages like Matthew 10, 20, because you are not speaking, but the spirit of your father is speaking through you. That is a promise to every minister of the church. And we just established who's a minister of the church. All of you, or as my friends in the South would say, all y'all. <laughs> You have that because you are not speaking, but the Spirit of the Father is speaking through you. See, it's not your job to go out there and convince somebody. That's the Spirit's job. Your job is to be faithful and obedient and to share the good news every shot you come up with, every time you've got a shot. And of course, the biggest way, how's the biggest way you can share the good news? What do you think? That's a good one. There's an even better one than telling somebody. Live it! Yes! Live it! Live the good news. Live the gospel. Then, exactly what Amy said, then start sharing it. Because if you're living it, guess what that gives credence to what you say? Because a lot of people are from Missouri. <laughs> They show me. Show me the gospel. Then you can tell me about it. I always thought it was a joke, but my mother really is from Missouri. It's not a joke. <laughs> no. Here's another one. Here's another promise that you can hold on to as a minister of the church. Luke 21, 15. For I will give you such words and a wisdom that a few of your adversaries will be able to resist and contradict you. None! <laughs> I love these passages because God deals in absolutes all the time. None of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict you when you are speaking such words, which are God's words, because you cannot argue with God's word. You can, but you're going to lose, which is why we have to know what God's word says. Eve knew what God's word said. He said, don't eat from it. But then what did she do to it? She added to it. Remember, I'm supposed to touch it. So what God said. So we need to know God's word so we're not adding to it. We're not subtracting from it. Because then none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict you. But we also have to remember verses like these. 1 Timothy 4.16 Pay close attention to your life and your teaching. Persevere in these things, for by doing this you will save both yourself and your hearers. You have to pay close attention to your teaching. You have to persevere in them. That's what we just said a minute ago. You have to live the word before you can do it. And then pay close attention to what you are telling others. Is it accurate? Is it what God said? Am I adding to it and saying, don't even touch it? Because it's not what God said. Have we seen ministers add to God's word and make a mess of it? Adding rules that aren't there. Putting a burden on people that isn't there because they've added to God's word. Sometimes in an effort to help people, but they add to God's word. God's word stands on its own. It doesn't need you to help it. We also have to remember verses like 1 Corinthians 3.13. Each one's work will become obvious. For the day will disclose it because it will re be revealed by fire and the fire will test the quality of your work. So along with those first two that says hey, God's word is going to come out of you because you are ministers and it's going to be powerful. We also have to remember that we have to be careful about our teaching. Make sure our teaching is accurate. Yes? Um, so this comes up a lot in my circle and, and it has to do with these other religions, you know, um, the, the Muslim faith and the LDS and Seventh-day well, Seventh Adventists before. But anyway, um, the scriptures and, and and books that they are using really condemn themselves against the Bible, right? They don't read anything outside of what they're actually practicing and studying to know that what they're 
But that's also the same for us, that when we are misapplying the Bible or we are adding to it or we are subtracting to it, we are equally as convicted of doing the wrong, teaching the wrong thing and following the wrong path. And, you know, so I just want to make that point. Like, you know, any, any of us can be convicted in what we're practicing simply by the, the books we're using and simply by the Bible. Yes. Here. Oh, absolutely. The same way that a Muslim, if they studied their own documentation, would know that that's not the way. That's not the truth, and that's not the way. Mm-hmm. And, and we, yeah, absolutely. And we just have to be careful to make sure that we are only going where this goes. And then you are that invincible, unstoppable force. Let me concentrate for two minutes, we'll be done, on those that we regularly think of those as ministers, pastors, that stuff, what we kind of can call ministers. Here's some promises just for professional, professional ministers. How blessed will you be, you who sow beside all waters? Isaiah 32, 30 in the New American Standard. The word picture there is that you're going, you're, you're looking to sow everywhere beside all waters. You're not just picking a particular, I'm just going to talk to these people. A professional minister should be willing to talk literally to anyone. All professional ministers need to be in constant prayer that the Lord will deliver them from mere professionalism. I can't tell you how many emails I get every week giving me seminars and books and stuff on how to preach a better sermon and how to administrate your congregation in a, in a, in a stronger method and all this stuff. And this stuff is good. But guess what the trap is? Just mere professionalism, where I get so dependent upon these methodologies to be a good pastor that I forget that what being a good pastor is sowing my seed beside every water that I come on. Pastors and all of the saved are blessed as they seize every opportunity to witness to God's saving grace and power. That's where my blessing comes from. Every chance I get. I had a phone call this week at the house on when I'm supposed to be going to bed early because I have to get up at 5 in the morning to go teach. That went on for an hour. But that's okay. Because this individual needed to hear God's word. Needed the assurance of what God's word would think. It was struggling with stuff. That's my job. And that's where I get blessed, is by sowing any time the seed can be sown. It's not just to be held for prescribed times and seasons. Hey, I only do this on Sunday mornings, the rest of the time. It's the seed is to be planted wherever and in whomever the opportunity presents itself. But professional ministers, professional ministry can be a very lonely place where you can feel like your labor is in vain and you agree with the prophet in Isaiah 49 4 I have labored in vain I have spent my strength for nothing in futility <clears throat> because as my old mentor said people are rascals <laughs> and he wasn't talking about people outside the church when he was training me and teaching me, he said, people in the church are rascals. And you, get, you can get this feeling of loneliness, that all of your effort is in vain, because here they're doing the same stupid stuff again. But the prophet Isaiah goes on to say, in the rest of the verse, yet my vindication is with the Lord and my reward is with God, not with how well the church is doing, the church being Levine Baptist for me. That is not my vindication, that is not my reward. 
My reward and vindication is with God. And that's what professional ministers need to remember because a boatload of professional ministers quit the ministry every year because they are burned out. Because they're not seeing what they consider to be growth. They're not seeing people in their church are rascals. The promise is that the time and effort will not be in vain. Jeremiah 3.15. Somebody look that one up real quick. I, I know I didn't hand that one out. Jeremiah 3.15. Particularly if you're electronic and you can just speak it in. Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart <clears throat> who will lead you and who will lead you with the knowledge and understanding I will give you these shepherds who are going to do this. What a great promise, church. That God is going to put a shepherd here at Levine Baptist Church that will lead us and guide us in spite of it being an entire church of rascals. <laughs> a flock is always well fed when it has a pastor according to God's heart, which is what he has promised. Then the flock is well fed. Next week, we're going to look at promises relative to Christian doctrine as we continue to unpack these promises for Christians. Jeremiah, would you close us this morning? Yeah. Oh. Father, thank you for another day. Thank you for the of there among our ones. Open our hearts and minds as we go and listen to your word today. All of the things this name. Amen. Amen. We'll see you next week. No pop quiz next week, so don't worry about it.